Well, good afternoon. We have the, uh, the wonderful opportunity of talking to you after lunch. So hopefully um, that will not be a problem. Uh, this panel will be looking at intellectual property uh, of all sorts, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and dot, dot, dot. I think some of our speakers will push it even beyond that. Uh, now, I will make a personal comment about, about Richard here uh, in that Richard and I have found over the years many areas, I think, of agreement, which may not be the first thing you would think of uh, if you thought about being Richard, but, but in fact, it's true. And I will say, when I first got to the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, one of the things we were doing is we were trying to create a set of antitrust guidelines for intellectual property licensing. And the first, the first rule was intellectual property is property, is intellectual property. You know, it just, it's property. You know, so if I say I have a monopoly over this piece of paper, I do. I'm not, I might not give it to you. Um, but it doesn't mean I have an economic monopoly over it. So if you have intellectual property, you may or may not have an economic monopoly too. Anyway, uh, Richard, I believe, has written many times that intellectual property is property, and it deals with things that are a little more elusive sometimes, ideas, creativity, establishment of boundaries, overcoming market imperfections, and things that should be familiar. So naturally, uh, with all of that to interest one, this is not um, an area that Richard chose to leave untouched. And as a matter of fact, I think as we've been learning today, uh, it may not be that there is such an area. I'm still looking to see after Richard has not written about some area, which might have been an easier, shorter symposium. Um, <laughs> so intellectual property, like other forms of property, uh, needs government in a certain respect. Uh, we need the government to define where the property rights are. And Richard himself has noted that need for demarcation. Uh, I noticed a recent book review um, looking at the, the recent book uh, for, by May and Cooper, The Constitutional Foundations of Intellectual Property. But you have the problem, how do you demarcate an idea? Um, and I think the answer depends at least in part on what kind of intellectual property right you're talking about. You're talking about a patent, a copyright, trade secret, etc. But once that's defined, not surprisingly, Richard goes back to first principles and makes the argument that intellectual property can be integrated uh, pretty straightforwardly into the rest of property. So in that spirit, he's argued, for instance, that the full takings apparatus should apply to intellectual property as it does to physical property. He also, and we've heard him small bet about this this morning, and I think we'll hear more this afternoon, he also has insisted that there's no justification for a different remedial regime. This was a working paper that sharply criticizes the Supreme Court's decision in eBay against Merck Exchange, and again, about which more in this panel. So we have three great speakers, actually we have three and a half speakers, uh, and I will explain that. Um, our first speaker will be Professor Shyam uh, Balganesh from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Professor Balganesh is a graduate of the Yale Law School, where he was an articles and essays editor of the Yale Law Journal. Prior to that, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He attended Balliol College at Oxford and earned a BCL and MPhil in law. And he also holds uh, degrees from the National Law School of India University and his scholarship does focus on intellectual property, and I gather he's doing something on the history of copyright now. Next, we will have um, Professor Scott Keefe, who is all a graduate of Penn Law, as well as MIT, where he studied molecular biology and microeconomics. He was inducted in, as a member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts in March 2012. Professor Keefe, had the interesting experience of serving on the U.S. International Trade Commission, an independent agency that partly enforces our trade laws, from October 2013 through June of 2017. And today, in addition to his service on the George Washington uh, University Law Faculty, he's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. 
his expertise and his academic interests, I can only summarize there, they look almost as broad as Richard's. Uh, they certainly include intellectual property. Uh, and finally, as a presenter on the last paper, we have Adam Mosoff, who's a graduate of this law school, a former research assistant uh, to Richard, who also holds a master's degree in philosophy from Columbia. Today, uh, Adam is a professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, and he is the founder and director of the Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property. And he has done quite a bit with patent law. Adam's co-author, this is, I'm making the half. Uh, Adam's co-author will not be a presenter, but is certainly here for purposes of any Criticism. discussion. <laughs> right, we can blame everything on Eric. Yep. And we'll Adam all the credit. Uh, but Eric is a colleague uh, of Adam's at the Antonin Scalia Law School of George Mason. Uh, and uh, he is also a member of Princeton's James Madison Society and a senior scholar at the Law School's Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property. And looked to me as though it was a fair statement to say that, that uh, Professor Clays is particularly interested in the influence of natural law uh, on American law. So without further ado, Tom. Oh. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers. It's an honor and privilege to be here to comment on half a century of Richard's fabulous work. Um, I, it's, it's um, something that I'm talking about, common law intellectual property, as Judge Wood mentioned. I'm not going to be talking about the standard areas of intellectual property. I'm going to be talking about Richard's contributions to an area of intellectual property that aren't really covered in any traditional intellectual property discussion. These are basically state, mostly state judge-made common law doctrines that mimic the structure of traditional intellectual property through liability regimes. So they try and create exclusivity through liability regimes. And I'm going to talk about Richard's contributions, important contributions to these two, and some of the core assumptions underlying the way in which he constructs his arguments. But I think it's, it's interesting that I'm talking about common law intellectual property because my first interaction with Richard uh, now a little bit over a decade ago, began over common law intellectual property. And I learned and have ever since heard him use a phrase specifically towards me multiple times that emanated from this first encounter. So I was a graduate student at Oxford uh, studying legal philosophy, working on the philosophy of electronic trespass. Yes, it sounds esoteric and weird. And I came across is Richard Epstein, this big name in property, having written a bunch of articles on it. So what do I do, green as I was? Sent Richard drafts of my papers on the topic. Uh, and within a few hours, I got six of his drafts <laughs> and an email with comments on my drafts, which included multiple times this phrase, fundamentally misguided. <laughs> fundamentally misguided. And in the years since, that has been the way in which we have interacted, and he has given me significant comments, very helpful comments, but they've always included the topic sentence, fundamentally misguided, in, in all of them. And, and ever since, Richard convinced me that it wasn't worthwhile to stay on to do my doctorate at Oxford, that if I wanted to be a real academic, I needed to cross the Atlantic, because no academic, look at Ronald Rourke, and he didn't stay on for his DPhil, and he was the last person ever to have really tried to make an impact and then failed, is what Richard said to me. And so I decided to go to law school in New Haven, where, Richard may not know this, I petitioned the faculty to try and get my law degree, the JD, in two years, saying that way back in 1966, they let a student by the name Richard Epstein do it, and, and he seems to have turned out pretty much OK. Uh, and so that I had studied law at Oxford, and please give me the same opportunity. They took about six weeks and then eventually said yes. I think the only reason was because they didn't really care about teaching too much law in that first year. Uh, but in my second year of law school, uh, between the first and second year, which I was only there for two years, uh, I went to work at a law firm and really hated it. Uh, I knew I wanted to be an academic, and I, I needed to figure out how much of this law firm thing I needed to do before I could really start doing writing again. So I reached out to Richard. Uh, at the time, and again, this time I didn't get a fundamentally misguided uh, response. Got a response back saying, yours is a problem that everyone should have. Meet me for lunch tomorrow in Central Park. So we landed up at, at, at apparently his favorite Italian restaurant, Central Park West, uh, and uh, as we sit down, we order our entrees. Uh, the server comes and gives us a big plate of bread and olive oil, which Richard proceeds to 
single-handedly finish in about 15 minutes, and then looks at me and blames me for it. And he says, you're responsible for this. You're going to have to tell my wife about it. And then, knowing what I did about Richard and his account of causation, I make the mistake of saying, aha, you are indeed a causal maximalist, right? mm -hmm. which Hart and Honoré had called it. And no, the conversation for the next 20 minutes proceeded to him telling me how Hart and Honoré were fundamentally misguided <laughs> and had totally mischaracterized his view. And from then on, I learned that there were a few very, very important ideas and, and, and arguments in Richard's career that he believes were, were um, mischaracterizations of his views. And one of them relates to common law intellectual property, which I will cover in my uh, paper and in my essay. So as I said, I'm going to talk about common law intellectual property, which are these state doctrines uh, that Richard has spent a good amount of time analyzing. And in fact, I'm going to say he's been deeply influential in constructing the nature of the debates on two of these doctrines, which I cover in my paper. The first one is hot news misappropriation, or the misappropriation doctrine emanating from INS versus AP. And the second one is the doctrine of cyber trespass. Uh, so I'll start with the first. The INS versus AP doctrine is one that is hopefully covered in every first year property law class. Uh, it's a pre-Erie federal common law decision where the constructed facts were a dispute between two news collectives one seemingly unscrupulous news collective that had been banished from the war front decides to lift stories from a competitor. And the other news collective is unhappy about this and having failed to shame the copier uh, into stopping its practices, seeks a legal remedy. And the matter reaches the Supreme Court. And in a carefully crafted opinion, Justice Pickney structures a form of relief for the plaintiff in what he calls quasi-property, relying on a variety of different common law doctrines. Now, Richard, in a very important article written in the 1990s, describes the INS versus AP decision. But what he does in it is he tries to understand what the real analytical roots of Justice Pitney's formulation was. And he locates it in the common law of property, trying to find a rationale in first possession and locking <coughs> labor theory that suggests that what Pitney was really doing in this construction of quasi-property was creating a two-tiered property structure and engaging in a form of social utilitarian engineering. So Richard's argument in the paper is that Pitney had two conclusions, two, two possibilities. One, he could have replicated custom, or he could have engaged in social engineering. He chose the latter quite consciously and arrived at the same result, which was just as efficient and just as optimal. Right? And Richard, therefore, then extols in a variety of different ways the way in which Pitney constructs his argument calling Pitney the single most underrated justice in the history of the Supreme Court. This is, uh, I do, but the but, but question is, that was in the 1990s. Is there a more underrated one in the years since? <laughs> All right. OK, so that's INS versus AP and Richard's construction of that doctrine. The second area, cyber trespass, is an area that owes its origins and its demise, unfortunately, entirely to Richard Epstein. Uh, Richard Epstein single-handed constructed this doctrine in a case, which began as a federal case, eBay versus Bitter's Edge, which involved the auction website eBay, and then a set of a company called a bid aggregator that used to go to different auction websites. There was a time when eBay had competitors, and would aggregate information, not, not necessarily expression that was copyrighted, information about auctions and put it on its website as a one-shop stop for customers through the use of electronic bots that would obtain information. And eBay obviously didn't like this and sought an injunction on this theory of trespass. And Richard files an amicus brief in the case where he says that the appropriate metaphor for the court to use is real trespass, not trespass to chattels. And the court, in a not particularly well-reasoned opinion, it's Intel, not no, 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 Intel's the next one. That's the demise. Uh, uh, the court adopts Richard's argument. And for a few years, about four or five years, we have a, I wouldn't say a robust, but a alive cyber trespass doctrine modeled on real trespass. The matter makes its way through different courts and eventually lands up in the California Supreme Court in a case known as Intel versus Hamidi that involved a disgruntled former Intel employee who starts sending spam to Intel. Intel tries blocking uh, the spam and is ultimately unsuccessful and then seeks an injunction on Richard's theory of cyber trespass. But this time, the matter reaches the Supreme Court and in an opinion, uh, so again, Richard files an amicus brief saying that the appropriate metaphor is trespass 
to land, not trespass to chattels. And the California Supreme Court this time disagrees with Richard, but they do so in a way that was harsh and unfair. Justice Werdiger calls out Richard Epstein as trying to propertize the world and says that he has a dystopian view of the internet that is going to chill speech, and therefore, this cannot be the appropriate metaphor. All right, so Richard is obviously deeply unhappy, writes a whole series of articles, and this, I found out, was his second pressure point. Why? Because a couple of years ago, Richard came to visit me in my office just before I was heading out to teach property. And I made the, I think, mistake of telling Richard, jokingly, that I was going to head into class and tell my students why Justice Werdiger was right. Richard followed me halfway to my class to try and convince me that Justice Werdiger was unquestionably wrong. At which point, I, about six or seven minutes into it, I had to tell Richard, no, Richard, I was just kidding. As you know from our back and forth, that I have agreed with your view on Justice Werdiger's position. All right. INS versus the AP and cyber trespass. Richard has, has made significant contributions. What I do in the paper is, beyond pointing out what Richard's actual positions are and his description of these doctrines, I think there are four important ideas or assumptions underlying the way in which he constructs his analysis of the doctrine that I think are worthy of being brought to the surface. And I, I'd like to hear the extent to which Richard is willing to openly embrace them or disagree with my characterization of them. So the first of these is that Common law intellectual property, not just the two that he describes, having necessary <coughs> private law foundation. That is a, a implicit but strong theme in the way in which he constructs his analysis. Now, to those of you who are private law scholars and private law lawyers, this may seem obvious, but you'd be surprised to know that within the intellectual property domain, the idea that intellectual property is a private law subject is on the margin because the social utilitarian construction and the idea that this is a regulatory regime driven exclusively by the public interest has resulted in the analytical structure of intellectual property, not just common law intellectual property, being seen as wholly contingent. Wholly contingent to the extent that if one can arrive at the same result without the intellectual property structure, that's considered perfectly acceptable. In Richard's writing, he takes very seriously the notion that intellectual property rights are rights that there is at the root of the way in which things are structured a property slash autonomy interest. To the extent that there's a utilitarian overlay, it's an overlay over the structure of rights. You see this in his writing on INS versus AP, where he talks about not the public interest as an exception, but the necessity doctrine drawn from real property as the way in which one might think of exceptions to the structure of quasi-property. Private law foundations, therefore, are integral, central, and render the analytical basis of intellectual property in Richard's construction not contingent at all, in fact, central. But the question that this begs, then, is what does this independent analytical structure normatively bring to the construction of intellectual property? There, Richard isn't willing to go far enough. All right. The second thing about Richard's construction and an assumption underlying it is that intellectual property is necessarily derivative. He has a phrase that he uses time and time again, old wine and new bottles. That's what intellectual property is. And it's not just that intellectual property is about doctrinal borrowing from one area to another. It's instead that intellectual property is old doctrinal concepts and doctrinal structures being recast for new areas. This is important because, again, not only does it render the analytical structure of the area important, but it also potentially tells you that intellectual property regimes have an underlying normative basis that is not necessarily a regulatory one that is overlaid through the public interest. The third one is probably the most controversial claim, and I want to hear what Richard has to say this, because the old Richard Epstein, and this is an issue that's come up in tort law, was at, once, at one point in time writing about corrective justice and autonomy interests deriving from a Kantian basis. And we see elements of this in his writing on common law intellectual property. The new Richard Epstein has moved in the purely instrumental direction. One sees in his writing on common law intellectual property, I believe, an approach to melding instrumental and non-instrumental considerations. If one looks at the way in which I have a quote in the paper, he describes his shift. He says that today I view corrective justice as embedded within an overall consequentialist doctrine. And therefore, one is descriptive, the other is necessarily normative. I think this very importantly partakes of an approach to solving the incommensurability problem known as conceptual sequencing. 
which is either treating one normative variable as normative and the other one as positive, or alternatively, building it on the defeasible structure of a common law action and letting in normative values at different points in time in the analysis, which is exactly what Richard did many years ago in his nuisance piece, corrective justice and its utilitarian constraints. You begin with a corrective justice formulation, overlay it with utilitarianism, but that still means one trumps the other. That utilitarianism can override co corrective justice in the way in which it works. I see Richard's account of common law intellectual property doing exactly the same thing. My last point is something that goes back to something Tom mentioned in the morning, which is Richard's embrace and affection for common law intellectual property necessitates an acceptance of the virtues of judicial lawmaking. One of the biggest criticisms of common law intellectual property has been that judges are ill-equipped to make these kinds of determinations. Everything needs to be statutory or perhaps regulatory, but not within the judicial context. Richard, within this domain, seems to accept the virtues of incrementalism. That judge-made law proceeding incrementally from the context of individual cases allows a good degree of experimentation. Again, this begs the question, what does that necessarily mean for the overall normative structure? of intellectual property, and the extent to which this overall approach to judicial lawmaking can be extended to other purely statutory areas like copyright, trademark, and patent. And all in all, I think Richard's overall contributions to common law intellectual property are of the kind that without Richard's work over the last couple of decades, we would probably not even have the few doctrines that we do as robust and as intellectually rigorous as they exist today in the scholarly world, let alone in the jurisprudence of state courts. Uh, but I look forward to hearing how Richard's going to tell me in a few minutes why I'm fundamentally in the sky. Thank you, Richard. Scott? Scott? Thank you very much, Sean. That was great. I, I also, as someone who teaches, uh, just finished a semester of property and, and your discussion of the, in, uh, the Intel case, I, I at least will just offer this thought, which is that buried in the California Supreme Court opinion, is a lot of discussion that strikes me as a reader as an empirical claim that surely it is neither worth very much to the putative trespasser nor costing very much to the putative trespassee to have somebody climbing around your cyber network. And shame on you um, for thinking uh, being out of touch, uh, Richard, uh, shame on you for being so focused on history. The modern world uh, of computer systems just don't care about cyber trespass. And I will just ask us to maybe invite the California Supreme Court to think about the 2016 election uh, <laughs> and ask themselves whether a billion dollar presidential campaign is trivial cost and ask themselves whether driving the result of an election is trivial cost or benefit. Because it seems to me folks care about a billion dollars. Uh, as a law professor, it takes us, I think, a significant course overload to earn an extra billion dollars. <laughs> so um, look, Richard, what a treat to celebrate you. Uh, what a treat to be back here in High Park in Chicago to celebrate you. Um, although I grew up here and my folks used to be resident masters next door at Burton Judson, I didn't really meet you until Mark Siegler uh, brought us together through the medical school's uh, McLean Center um, Conflict of Interest Committee. And it was a pleasure to then later work for you when you were dean here uh, and I was a visiting uh, uh, a scholar, a uh, professor teaching patent law. So it, that's how we met. We have enjoyed working together on a bunch of different things over the years. And um, that has given me a chance to learn a lot, although having not been your student formally in a classroom, to learn a lot from you, from your writing, and from working next to you and getting access to that amazing brain of yours. You uh, encouraged me always to think about the common law and about custom. And I want to try to uh, take some lessons from some of your papers, three of your papers in particular. Uh, like Shime, I uh, 
am moved by your INS Virginia Law Review 1992 paper that talks about custom as a source of law. Also, your common law and insider trading uh, Yale Law Journal piece in 2016. Uh, not just custom, common law too. And then, of course, your Stanford Law Review 2010 piece, disintegration of uh, IP, this notion that I think I think the way you would put it, Richard, is that is that the details start to matter. So for me, I'm especially moved as well that President Obama's um, uh, um, uh, portrait is up outside of this room because it was his nomination that put me in a position to then work at the International Trade Commission uh, on a set of issues that, at least for me, gave me a chance to see your ideas in action. Let me, let me step back for a moment and just highlight how the ITC works so that we can see it's, it's a strange place. So there are a lot of so-called independent commissions in the United States government, the Federal Trade Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Communications Commission. These are New Deal agencies, and they have a structure that is pretty common uh, one to the other, which is an odd number of commissioners, five. So while, yes, there's a bipartisanship, there's always a majority in the president's party. And there's a chair who can be put in place and generally removed by the president and often can sit for the term of the president. So you have a president backing up a chair, backing up a majority, backing up a chair, backing up a president. Up and down, you have a lot of fairly robust power. The International Trade Commission grows out of a totally different era. I think we all wish that we had gone to war during the Civil War over slavery only. But it turns out the politics of tariffs was a big driver to the Civil War. And the economics, the chairman of the economics department at Harvard, Frank Taussig at the time, wrote up a model agency that was designed to cause that confrontation to happen in a commission. So it's a six-member commission with a chair required by statute to rotate person and party every two years, and nine-year terms that are staggered in the statute. So it's designed to, in fact, require, or I would say coerce, the kind of exchange that the New Deal independent commissions discuss but don't really do. This is an agency that has to do because you've got the six, because you've got the rotating chair. And so it's a part of the government that ends up advising the political branches of the government, adjudicating, and then also administering. And I want to talk about the adjudication role. And I want to talk about it in the context of Richard's focus on private law, custom, common law, and some details. So some concrete examples that are relevant, just like the shift in Intel, just like the shift to totally new business models, I think that you're seeing a lot of new business models around intellectual property. And I think that they all basically look like circumvention. And here's here are some examples. Uh, we might have what is patent infringement. There are all sorts of interesting debates about whether we should have a patent system. There are all sorts of interesting debates about what, what, how you test out validity and infringement. But these are cases where you're past all of those, where you have decided you've got a patent system and you have adjudicated in a range of settings patent validity and patent infringement. And instead, what you do is the infringer disaggregates its business model. It sets up shop with part of its operations outside of the United States and part of its operations inside of the United States. They are connected over the internet. And in so doing, tries to avoid intellectual property infringement. 
And so the first example I want to go to is actually not an, a case that originated in the ITC, but a case that impacts the ITC in trade. It's Grokster. So Grokster, of course, first got discussed in the intellectual property settings as, case, as a case where one side says, you must protect our content, and the other side said, absolutely, you must leave the internet free. And then it devolved into debates about how this dual use technology, the internet, how many infringing and non-infringing uses it might have. That's a very complicated question. I'll leave it to others to answer. But how did Don Verrilli, the lawyer arguing the case, who later became Solicitor General, how did he tee it up using Richard Epstein-esque private law principles. He teed it up in a totally different way. And the way he teed it up, for those of you who remember the old radio show, The Shadow, The Shadow Knows, Only The Shadow Knows, it's always very hard to know what evil lurks in the hearts of other people, unless they write it down. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened in Grokster. Grokster had, in fact, said to its investors in writing, invest in me. I'm going to have a whole lot of customers. My customers are going to include some people who want to share legitimate copies, and then a whole lot more who are going to want to infringe copyright. Yahoo! Let's do it. Let's market to those people. Hey, great. So now we have the custom out in communities back to Roman law where legal systems say, if your entire business model is to poke your finger in someone else's eye, if your entire business model is to interfere with someone else's business model, legal systems will have a problem with that. Now, we can discuss exactly the contours of that problem, but what made Grokster so compelling was that appeal to that common business practice that Don Verrilli managed to get a 9-0 vote out of the Supreme Court in the face of a statutory regime, Title 17, that didn't even have an inducement to infringe provision in the statute. They imported it entirely out of Title 35. So you have a unanimous Supreme Court taking a doctrine and pouring it into a statute, 9-0. That's how compelling that was. So I want to give another example. Richard's discussion of common law. The common law example that I think can be helpful is to think about what is colloquially called in the intellectual property system joint infringement. But here's the same hypothetical. We divide up an activity across the internet, but people are working together. Well, in the patent field, that gets debated as, is one inducing the other? I, I, that's an interesting question, but let's put it aside. When we teach corporate law, we always include one question on our exam. On the bar exams that test on this, there's one question. The so-called defective corporate formation hypothetical, where the students are, in effect, asked to remind the teacher that they paid attention to agency law and partnership law before they got into corporate law, which is that if you don't correctly form a corporation, that doesn't mean you go to jail. It means, oops, you formed a partnership. You're doing stuff together. And if you're doing stuff together, you're a partnership. And if you're a partnership, then what one of you does creates liability for all of you, jointly and severally. So while there may be some doctrinal IP approaches to debating joint infringement, there's a common law answer plead and prove the existence of a partnership, separately plead and prove intellectual property infringement, and you've accomplished the exact same result without having to enter these broad textured debates about too much and too little. Once again, Richard's work, in this case the common law, offers a relatively simple way, in the words of, of Judge Easterbrook, a law of the horse kind of way, to just simply get to the exact same result. So back now to the end and the details and some other big changes that are happening in the system. Think about 3D printing. Think about computer controlled manufacturing. Think about the idea of setting up infringement models where you project across the internet. 
And here's the concrete example. One of the cases we had was called Clear Correct. It involved a competitor called Invisalign. In the early days when I was a kid here in High Park, I would walk over to the High Park Bank building to get my braces tightened if I wanted orthodontia work. In the modern world, that's not how it happens. In the modern world, you have these plastic implants that click onto your teeth, and you have multiple plastic implants made, each one ever so slightly different from the next, and over time, that moves your teeth. Well, there was a patent infringement suit brought. It was one, it was a relatively old-fashioned technology lawsuit. It involved plastics, right? This is the graduate, plastics. Go into that business, young man. And stuff you could touch. Well, here's the thing, after that case was over, it turns out you have a lot of really, really smart people in Pakistan who understand computer systems, who understand medicine and dentistry and engineering, and so you know what the next solution was. It was to provide to an orthodontics office a 3D printer, have models of teeth created, like you create a PDF now with a document, send the model, the blueprint, into the United States and have it 3D printed at the orthodontics desk instead of shipping into the United States the plastic orthodontic click that would click onto your teeth. Now, what, do, what does that do? That triggers the same thing as happening with cable boxes. Cable TV companies provide you with a box. That box is a Trojan horse. It gets into your living room and then it provides you with content and functionality that competitors think infringe either their copyrights or their patents. In both of these settings, you end up with two big debates. One, what's an article? Two, what's a sale? Those happen to matter because of the ITC, our statute, requires articles that are imported for sale. What's an article? What's a sale? So I think it's just worth noticing that in the INS case, a hundred years ago, co-located next to the Congress is the Supreme Court, co-located right there on Capitol Hill, you've got electronic transmissions into the United States as some form of unfair competition, whether you like it or not, at least it was happening, the Supreme Court's recognizing it. And I think that we can talk more about this during the Q&A if you would like, but your approach to this common law and customary attention to detail gives us a lot of confidence finding in a positive law the word article to include electronic transmissions, not just tangible objects. Think, for example, of the sting. Think, for example, of insider trading cases. Think, for example, of ticker tape cases. Think, for example, of the Ben-Hur copyright case. These are all examples where changes in modality did not change the outcome of liability and inconsistent with custom and common law shouldn't. Think of the question of sale, the cable box. The cable companies argue, well, they're just renting you the cable box, so therefore it's not a sale. That's cute, that's great, that's an interesting argument. But again, as a commercial lawyer, you should recognize that there are an immense number of transactions that you might think of as an encumbered or limited sale, but the Uniform Commercial Code and the common law and Roman law call them security interests, which means they're sales. Thank you. All right, uh, Adam. So I am absolutely delighted to have been invited to participate in this, uh, this session for Richard. Um, Richard uh, has been a, a teacher, mentor, colleague, and friend to both I and, and my co-author, Eric, Eric Clays, at our, uh, who is a colleague of mine at my home institution. Um, I actually took panel off from Richard. Um, oh, my own. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and it's the only class I ever, ever took at, at 8.30 in the morning. It was the only time I've ever been awake at that time where I did not need coffee. Um, you know, I was also honored, as he mentioned his talk today, he was the dean when, he, when, when I graduated. And, you know, so his signature is on my diploma is one of my very proud, cherished possessions that I have. Um, and I have a very similar experience as Karen, where all of a sudden I received an email that said, you've received the, the Bradley Governance Fellowship.
I said, I have no idea why they see me in this. And, and, I, ran, and I, I just, but I happened to walk into Richard, we ran into him, and he said, of course, I just want to suggest that you should get it. And he did something very similar to, to me as well, because he knew my interest in wanting to become an academic. And so in my 3L year, he walked up to me in the hallway, and he said, why haven't you applied for an Olin Fellowship? And I said, uh, uh, what's an Olin Fellowship? And he said, apply. And then he kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like the old E.F. Hutton commercials when E.F. Hutton speaks, you just do it, you listen. So I did, and it started, and it started uh, began my, uh, my, my academic career. And, I mean, in, in all of these capacities, for both uh, Eric, Eric has very similar stories. He's been an exemplary model to us, I mean, just in, in many respects, an intellectual and academic father to us and to so many people here, in fact. Um, comparatively speaking, Eric and I are in the late teen years of our academic careers, as opposed to Richard, who's 50. So, uh, like all good teenagers, we've decided to pick a fight with our dad at this at this auspicious uh, event. So, um, so like many others speaking today and tomorrow, we've chosen to address a point of difference between Richard and us. And and the focal point is the function and justification for a specific remedy, an injunction, on a finding of an infringement of a valid patent. Right. Um, by the way, as an aside, our, our new title in our paper is Patent Injunctions, Economics, and Rights. Um, <clears throat> so a little more descriptive and clear. Now, as a foundational matter, we share with Richard a commitment to classical liberalism. And thus, we reach the exact same policy and legal outcomes as Richard uh, reaches when it comes to explaining and justifying injunctive remedies for patent infringements. But we arrive at this destination via very different methodological routes. Richard today is now well known as a consequentialist who deploys the law and economics and particularly the property rule liability rule framework in assessing these issues. Um, Eric and I uh, embrace in our scholarship and, and live by natural rights. And uh, in, in fact, the, uh, the type of uh, theory associated with John Locke in which we call in our paper eudaimonistic natural rights. So we believe this is an ideal place to kind of air this very foundational first principle and methodological difference between Richard and us. Um, if anything, as a general matter, because we're at the Chicago Law School. Um, and this is a very important debate that's associated with the Chicago School. How effectively can economic analysis of the law deal with philosophical questions of legitimate authority and coercion? Can it fully and adequately explain why we secure property rights with injunctions as opposed to damages and ongoing reasonable royalty uh, judgments? Um, in, in, in fact, in some, can it justify the use of coercive force, an injunction, on the grounds of this explanation, especially with respect to the interests of the citizens at issue, the interests of the citizens both in the property right and the person who's having the injunction brought against them as rational moral agents? These are key foundational concerns for all classical, classical liberals like Richard and Eric and, and myself. And as I said, we reach similar outcomes as Richard, but we are very different in our methods and foundations. Well, at least as we believe explicitly. We think Richard ends up in this exact same place as us because he's not entirely shorn his earlier natural rights-based commitments. With tongue only partly in our cheeks, in our paper, we, we refer to Richard as a faint-hearted natural rights theorist, a phrase we came up with in thinking about the namesake of our school, uh, uh, who referred to him once, himself once as a faint-hearted originalist. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, so the structure of my talk, uh, for the rest of my talk, will be as follows. Um, of course, we can't address every issue in our, in, our, in our paper. It has a lot of doctrine in there. And by the way, I'm, I feel a little uncomfortable because I'm not used to speaking this long un uninterrupted at both Chicago Law and my home institution. So you'll have to bear with me. Um, so I'm just going to focus on two examples that illustrate how economic analysis of the type used by Richard does not fully explain or justify an injunctive remedy for patent owners at least not without the added unstated content of normative principles, the foundational principles that we think are best supplied by eudaimonistic natural rights theory. Uh, and then last, we, I'm going to briefly describe, uh, which we go into further detail in our paper, um, why we think Richard is a faint-hearted natural rights advocate, because he mistakenly misunderstands what is Locke's philosophy and natural rights theory more generally. Um, then we'll turn it over for myself to be flayed alive by my father figure, and, uh, and, and, and in my death, uh, my co-author can continue the fight. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so let's start. So the basic uh, setup, institutional setup and doctrinal setup of a patent infringement, of course, you have a patent owner, single plaintiff, suing single or perhaps a couple defendants, right? Infringement, so what's the remedy? Um, now, a good example to illustrate this is you have an inventor or an immediate assignee of a patent who litigates 
on principle, which is not an uncommon feature in the American patent system. Eli Whitney, the inventor and patent owner on the cotton gin. Elias Howe, the patent owner on the lock stitch and the sewing machine. Charles Goodyear, uh, the patent owner on the method for making uh, vulcanized rubber. I mean, these people were people who litigated as a matter of justice and principle, oftentimes to great economic ruin. Uh, but a good modern example is Bob Kearns. Some of you may know him. He's the inventor of the inter intermittent windshield wiper, um, which he got a patent on and which was then promptly infringed by all of the major automobile manufacturers. This was described in an excellent uh, New Yorker article called The Flash of Genius. Um, and as a result of that infringement, he engaged, engaged in a decades-long litigation campaign against the automobile manufacturers at, uh, at great personal and financial loss to himself. Um, it's detailed very well in, in, in the article, which was made in actually into a movie called Flash of Genius. Um, and when he was asked, well, why did you do this? He had a very simple response. He said the infringement was, quote, unjust and illegal, unquote. Um, so he was litigating. He's your classic example of the person who was litigating on principle. So well, let's apply the property rule liability rule framework to this. Well, you have low transaction costs because you have very small numbers of parties. You have Bob Kearns, a single po property owner. You have, you have you know, five, six major automobile manufacturers. So that suggests property rule protection. Transaction costs are very low. They should be able to, to negotiate to a settlement that's efficient in the marketplace. But as Richard and, 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 and mature mainstream law and economics recognizes, right, there are problems with bilateral monopoly and holdout concerns that raise transaction costs and which can shift the concern, uh, the justification to a liability regime. So how do we understand what Bob Kearns is doing then when he's litigating like this on principle? Is he, um, <clears throat> is he uh, a holdout? Right? Is he someone who's, in, who's acting strategically? Uh, as, uh, as Scott said, you often don't know what's actually in people's minds. He said, I'm litigating on principle, but maybe he really just cared. You know, he was litigating for other reasons. right? And, he, and regardless of what his reasons are, is he, is he litigating strategically in a way that undermines overall social welfare by increasing transaction costs through the litigation or by, or by demanding more than what he should receive for, his, uh, for the use of his property? Um, and in fact, the automobile manufacturers over the decades repeatedly tried to settle with him. He rejected their settlement, saying, I'm going to hold you accountable in court because what you did was wrong. Um, so he was not interested in settlement. Um, or on the other hand, is he someone who's just protecting his subjective value? His subjective value. Now, this is an equivocal concept in, in, in law and economics because it includes both kind of the monetary value that you want subjectively might, might, might have in something, but it also gets included, what also gets grouped into it are non monetary, incommensurable values like a commitment to justice. Um, and, and that's incommensurable. It's, it's, it's not fungible in terms of dollars and cents. And so this ends up being a bit of a black box variable in the economic analysis of the property rule, liability rule framework. Um, at the end of the day, what is a person who is protecting their subjective value? Well, it's a person who's not a holdup. Um, and this, by the way, is not unique to patent law and, try and, and having to, to draw this distinction. You see it in property law cases. In fact, in the very prominent case of New London versus Kilo, right? The identification of whether Suzette Kilo was simply protecting her subjective value or was she a holdout, there was a great split among, among law and economists on this matter. Tom Merrill was testified before Congress that she's a classic example of a holdout. This was a legitimate use of eminent domain power when you have a land assembly problem because she was increasing transaction costs and preventing this from happening. Um, so in dealing with property rights and, and inventions in particular, there are colorable arguments on both sides as a matter of economic analysis. Now, Richard even acknowledges this in the real property context, right? So in his 1997 Yale Law Journal article on, on, on the very framework of the property rule, liability rule, a distinction, he wrote in assessing remedies or transaction uh, cost analysis, quote, the claims are implicitly empirical but not capable of precise justification, end quote. And thus, quote, the choice between property rules and liability rules is often decided at a very high level of theoretical abstraction, unquote. Right? And that's typically how you see the debates thus occurring at very high levels of abstraction and the framing of what are of what's happening. And so Richard, of course, includes in his 1997 article, and even in his specific writings on patent law, um, that as a systemic matter, we should secure subjective values of property owners. Thus, Bob Kearns should be allowed to litigate and to get his injunction. But that's drawing on unstated normative premises, we believe, about the value of liberty and the role of exclusive property rights in securing individuals a, a capacity to have flourishing lives in society. 
This is what's meant when you see courts constantly referring to property as securing the, quote, exclusive use and enjoyment of an asset, unquote. So property rights secure a sphere of liberty in creating and using assets that are necessary for a flourishing individual life in civil society. Now, Richard has talked about this a lot in other contexts. And this is his classical liberalism. And Eric and I agree with this. And we think it's laudable and right. But economics doesn't defend or justify those normative premises, or at least when it is attempted to do so, such as on grounds of wealth maximization, it is run into very rocky and highly contested grounds. Now, this point about consequentialist analysis trading on implicit conceptions of value is further illustrated with another example from patent litigation. Um, and so to change it a little bit, you have an owner of a patent on a component that's made part of an assembled product that's sold as a single consumer product. Think your smartphone. Um, which has thousands of patents on it. They get millions of licenses over the past decades for these things. Um, classic example is the owner of the patent actually on some key technologies like your 4G. Um, this is a very hotly contested issue right now. And this is, in fact, there's a theory called patent holdup, which is the application of patent law of, uh, of patent hold, of hold out as discussed in property. Theory. Now, in his amicus brief in eBay, Richard and his fellow amici argued that, uh, that a patent owner on a standardized technology deserves a larger share because it contributes most of the value. Uh, where does value and desert come from here? And we believe that you have similar ambiguities and problems like those in the Bob Kearns example. Um, on one hand, you could say, well, this is subjective value. But what do you mean by subjective value? And in what, and in what context? Um, or you could say, well, we're talking about the value of the patent on the component in this assembly. But there you lead to even further ambiguities. Do you mean the value, the price of just the component? So the price of the chip of which the 4G technology is on, which is worth pennies? Or do you mean the consumer value, the whole product at the end of the day? Because without 4G, this is a really awesome paperweight, right? This, I mean, so this is actually a significant portion of the value. Um, Further, there's a further problem is that if you're doing the transaction costs to make the differentiation between property rule versus liability rule, you need data on actually what the costs are. And in these disputes, you don't have the data. And very often times, courts and regulators are faced with a claim, a theoretical claim like patent holdup, and there's no data on this, and they're not allowed to say, well, I don't have any data, so go, go away. The court has to adjudicate the case. It has to come to a decision. Um, now, we believe this is why this explains the shift to appeals to value and desert. Now, again, we agree with Richard on, con on his conclusion, and even in his invoking desert and value, um, because we believe that, that his arguments ultimately implicitly rest on these fundamental normative premises. And that is that his, his arguments trade on a definite sense of value that is fundamentally normative, that a person deserves the fruits of their productive labors, and the function of property rights is to secure those fruits as part of a flourishing life in civil society. And that that is the interest that is secured by the coercive force of the state when it orders someone to stop using or otherwise interfering with someone else's property. And that this is only trumped, this interest, by either a default on that interest, on that right by the property owner, or by a violation of, of, of another uh, a, a person's interest in their equal rights. Now again, we think Richard gets to the right conclusion because he's drawing upon unstated normative premises to make these types of necessary distinctions. Well, lastly then, why does Richard miss this? Why is he invoking consequentialism and implicitly relying upon natural rights premises in his explanations for injunctions for infringements of patents? Now, this is even more of an uh, 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 interesting question because earlier in his career, Richard was much more like a classical liberal cut from the mold of a natural rights theorist. Um, but later in, the, uh, in his career, he shifted to explicit consequentialism. Now, he did so in part because of a misunderstanding of natural rights theory. Um, that you know, there was a, developed a conventional wisdom that natural rights theory, uh, particularly the theory of property rights, was incoherent and not explanatory in actual civil society. And this was a critique made by advocates for property rights, like Robert Nozick and others. Now, the assumption of this critique was that you have a basic dichotomy in ethical and political theory, a distinct a choice between consequentialism versus deontology. And we think Richard was led astray by, by, by these uh, critiques. And in his writings, he ends up conflating Locke and natural rights theory with deontology. But that's only one theory of natural rights. That's not Locke's theory or much of modern natural rights theory that was applied in Anglo-American political and legal thought in the 18th century. So Richard ends up assuming that natural rights is not capable of producing or justifying the practical reasoning that is necessary to be deployed by courts and, and government officials to secure the exclusive use rights that are fundamental to what it means to legally secure a property right to its owner. 
Now, this is an unfortunate mistake because it causes Richard to miss it. He can still use the new diamondistic natural rights theory from Locke in justifying how the law secures the interests of property owners through course of remedies like injunctions opposed against trespasses on their rights, whether in land or in an invention. So, thank you. Thank you. Richard, you have a nice broad scope of papers to comment on. Or work with friends like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question is, what am I supposed to say? I'm going to start with a story, because I always begin with stories to some extent. And uh, as Adam, Sean, Scott all kind of understand that I'm a man who's sort of conflicted between the so-called natural rights view of the world and the utilitarian view of the world. As I said before, all my Roman law students, right, Mr. Malloy, uh, spent a lot of time working about that distinction in connection with classical text one way or another. And so one day I was at a Liberty Fund meeting, and there was a fellow named George Martin, who was a professor at Wofford College um, of English, and I start to explain to him how it is that you can only ground uh, uh, traditional corrective justice and autonomy views in a larger framework which essentially tried to deal with transactions costs, whose central theorem would be if you wanted to reduce it to a Kosian sentence, is the way you maximize social welfare is to minimize transactions costs. And I went on at great length and I was getting speed up and I really felt that I was making progress. And after about 10 or 12 minutes of this, the man stops me and he looks at me and he says, I'm not really sure that I've understood everything you said. But I do know one thing for certain. If I could run a tape of this conversation before any jury in the United States, I could get you civilly committed. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, why? Or was I instead of headed for the loony? <laughs> because essentially there is the following deep tension between the two theories that that sentence went. He said, you're trying to persuade ordinary people, and that includes ordinary judges in ordinary cases. What happens is the corrective justice theory, without a formal foundational base, appeals to them in a very powerful and immediate way. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the kind of legitimacy, at least insofar as you're dealing with uh, particular kinds of disputes. And that's why everybody who starts at the middle of a thing is immediately attracted by the notion of corrective justice, which means exactly what Aristotle said. There was some imbalance that was created by the wrongful act of one person against another, and the purpose of the state is to introduce a remedy, which to the extent it is possible, will correct that, that error by returning to the status quo ante. And things, of course, get much more difficult when it's not possible to return to the status quo ante, and some other kinds of adjustments start uh, to take place. And so working within this kind of framework when you have relatively small number of problems gets you incredibly clear kinds of results. Um, it sort of explains the law of trespass. It explains freedom of contract in many kinds of ways. Um, it explains a little bit about the law of unjust enrichment and returning things and so forth. And for virtually any mid-level problem that you want in dealing with the system, the theory seems to work remarkably well. And judges who do not want to essentially sort of trouble themselves with grand philosophical questions are quite comfortable to sit within that frame of niche. Academics, however, in many ways are much more obnoxious about all of this stuff. And so what they start doing is to ask sort of very innocent and simple questions about foundational stuff, which don't have exactly the same stuff. And the first question, which again goes back to Roman law, is how do you acquire ownership of a particular thing? And even more importantly, in many ways, what are the particular things to which you can acquire ownership? There are certain things for which ownership rights are not going to be subject to entitlement. And if you simply try to look at a corrective justice theory, which explains how it is you undo errors by way of rectification, it doesn't quite give you a firm explanation as to why it is that you started in a certain place at the same time. And so in my early life, I started with mid-level kinds of questions trying to figure out how the theory of causation would work in individual cases, the push-pull models and so forth. And I thought there was much about the great treatment of Hart and Henri that was correct, but on matters of detail and execution, they often screwed things up in ways that you could correct on individual basis without upsetting the basic theory. But starting around the mid-1970s, late 1970s, all of a sudden, 
you started to worry about other kinds of problems, like how do you acquire possession to begin with, how do you deal with certain kinds of collective action problems with common pooled resources and the like, what do you do with antitrust and network industries, and the corrective justice model did not seem to work as well as you thought. So the question then was, is there anything you can do to answer the question of why is it that my possession of this particular thing uh, gives you the right to exclude everybody else on the face of the globe from occupying that particular question? Um, why is this not a, so I say, an infringement upon everybody else's rights? And it turns out there's no obvious answer to that. Our friend Locke got it completely wrong in one sense when he insisted that labor was the source of title as opposed to occupation, which was the common law rule. And so for a very long period of time, what you were trying to do, at least I was trying to do, was to work out this balance between what rights were individual, what rights were collective. And I found that I was in this very awkward type of situation in which on early on, how did you get property rights? I was a natural law theorist. And then on the rest of the system, how it is that you organize the subsequent rules for implicit in-kind compensation, nuisance cases, and so forth, you are a utilitarian. And I can't tell you the number of times that I was attacked for having a title of corrective justice and its utilitarian constraint. The argument is you're carrying water on two shoulders. Every time you have trouble with your natural law theory, you become a consequentialist. Every time you have trouble with your consequentialism, you become a natural law theorist. And that this was ultimately intellectually unstable. And it took a long time to work this thing through. But in the end, it came to me pretty clearly that both the autonomy arguments and the first possession arguments with respect to channels could rest very respectably on a system which said, if in fact we do allow one person to take something out of the commons, put up fences about it, allow other people to do it with other things, it's actually going to be a property rights system which will have demonstrable advantages by creating separabilities which allow for investment. If you did the same thing for a river, you would wreck resources so that the Romans were right after all when they had common property for long and skinny, or something we referred to earlier. And you have possessory rules with respect to shirt and squat. And at that particular point in time, you get completely different rules for water law than you do for land law. And the natural rights theory, which doesn't take all of these things into account, is in fact going to run into serious problems because it doesn't have a descriptive power which is sufficient to cover all the many forms of property. Well, exactly the same thing starts to talk about when you're dealing with intellectual property and the way in which you're going to have to put that position together. And that's why my friend Sean was sort of fundamentally misguided, uh, because what he was trying to do was to figure out how you could put this back into the same model that you had with respect to the possession of particular things. Justice Pitney was, in fact, a great genius. He was a classical liberal, but he was also trained as an equity lawyer in the New Jersey courts. So he was really good on understanding the way in which flexible remedies started to work. And INS is a profoundly anti-libertarian opinion in the following sense. The argument that was made in behalf of the ability to take stuff off the boards was essentially, I'm not using force, I'm not using fraud. Um, there's no copyright or anything like this. And so therefore, it's perfectly OK. He understood the misappropriation argument was really powerful, and that if one person could take advantage of the labor of another, under these circumstances, it would result in a diminution of the total amount of efforts going on. So he crafted a system which essentially said it's between direct competitors, you get the injunction, but as with respect to end users, you don't. He also gave a time limit with respect to the property rights. It lasted for one cycle of the news in 1918, uh, so that after that it became all publicity yours, not the actual story as written, but the information contained inside the story. It was also the case that the necessity feature really mattered. This custom was perfectly stable everywhere until the French and British stopped the Hearst papers from getting to the front lines. But the only stuff they stole was, in fact, for this. They didn't steal anything else because the other system essentially was perfectly stable over the long run. And the reason there was no contract, at the moment there was a contract between AP and United and UPI, and then they would have been collaborators and all would have been banned from the front and so forth. And so then you can figure out what's going on. And so the lesson you want to learn from this in the IP space with respect to the misappropriation 
is that here you get a judge forming a very nice kind of parallel system. There is no traditional Blackstone account of property which gets you into that particular case. It turns out it's perfectly stable. And most of the modern cases dealing with hot news that essentially disregard that particular framework usually result in a situation where the misappropriation does take place and the property rights system starts to get shut down, as happened in some of those cases that took place in New York with respect to information on a much shorter time frame having to do with intellectual property. Now, this thing also gets carried on to other problems. And so, Sean actually got the dates wrong, I'm happy to say. Only it turns out I wasn't crazy. I went back and checked it. Intel is 2003, eBay is 2006. And the point about the opinion that I, or the, the Richard, we're talking about eBay versus the, Bitter's Edge. The other eBay. Oh, oh that case was earlier. Yeah. 2001. Yeah, right. You get a gold star. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about murder. But I'm still fundamentally misguided. You are. Yes. <laughs> but the question, okay, I feel better already because I'm getting scared. Um, as to what's going on about, oh, five minutes. So let me just sort of finish this point very quickly. What I said is if you're trying to figure out how you put together rights in cyberspace, the fundamental point that you want to make on virtually all of these things is that uh, you have to replicate the same division between the commons and private property that you have with respect to land. And so to the extent that you have an intellectual highway, treat it as a highway. To the extent that you have an internet address, you treat it as an address. And what you do is you divide the things so that they can't stop you on the internet insofar as you're using the common elements, but they can keep you from trespassing on your side. In the single dumbest remark ever made by any federal or state judge, a Judge Werdiger announced, well, the problem about Professor Epstein in talking about the network industry is he's comparing this to a net. A net is a chattel, and so therefore he's wrong. The network analysis doesn't apply <laughs> with respect to chattels. Uh, it's hard to describe how uninformed that particular <laughs> sentence turns out to be, but it's repeated all the time in these books. Now, this then ties in, I think, with A, what, what Scott said, most of which I agree with, as you understand, is the trick in dealing with a system of property rights and a system of liability rules is that you must always do is to develop something so that if, in fact, the underlying technology start to change, you're still able to apply it to the new situations as it develops. That's exactly what I tried to do when I wrote the opinion in the Intel case on how this stuff was organized, explaining how the analogies really carried over and allowed for this particular form of injunction. And what Scott said, in effect, if instead of sitting the thing across the line, you ship the intellectual property across the line and then assemble it elsewhere, you know it's an evasion, and what you want to do is to stop. So then the question is, how good is this framework? Well, it is less elegant to some extent than a natural rights framework, which talks about rights and only rights. But let me mention to you something about O'Hearn in the windshield case. He approached me at one time and asked me to become his lawyer. I don't know if you knew this, right? And you spend about two minutes talking to the man. And then I actually spoke to the judge afterwards, and he was, he was crazy. Uh, he didn't even know a good deal when it was put in front of his place. And nine people had turned him down uh, beforehand as a lawyer in frustration because they could never get him to understand that people were actually overcompensating him for these things. He was standing on principle. And as my father used to tell me all the time, he says, son, sometimes you have to learn to rise above principle um, <laughs> in order to settle the case on terms that are a little bit more coherent in the way in which you want to put these things together. And so what happens is you don't want to look at him well, you don't want to look at the crazy people that Ward Farnsworth talks about in his article about folks who, when injunctive relief is given, they never bargain the rights away. Anytime you get somebody who's four or five standard deviations from the norm and you see their behavior, you ignore it. And you try to look at ordinary people. And what you discover when you look at these ordinary people is that the same mix and matching of remedies that I mentioned earlier works. The Calabresi framework, which says it's either or gets it wrong, and with injunctions and intellectual property, and I think here Scott and, and Sean are actually closer to you than to Adam, uh, what you do is you start with an injunction, then you subject it to conditions, uh, then in order to clean everything up, you use sort of damages at the end. As to the holdout and holdup problem, Cabin and Naruzzi and I have written this article on the subject and saying, well, there's a serious fundamental mistake in how this is approached by modern courts today, uh, because what they do is they see it as a one-sided problem in which the innovators are always doing all the dirty work and the implementers are not. We see it as a bilateral problem and so forth. And so what we try to do is to develop mechanisms whereby you can force them together to overcome this particular problem and think that you're able to do it. 
And the important thing is, if you are dealing with complex assemblies of major intellectual property, you have to disarm the injunctive relief to the extent that you're putting the system together, and you have to keep that system in place when it's otherwise. So where does this then start to lead it? Well, I think it leads you back to the place where it is. There is always going to be some kind of tension between natural law and utilitarian kinds of consequentialism. But it's important to remember that when you're talking about the utilitarianism in this particular place, it's not a notion that utility is some omnipresence of the sky. It's what you do is you have all the individuals in the world with all of their subjective values. You can't have precise measures in all cases as to how it does. But essentially, each and every transformation that you make by coercive institutional situation is designed to basically be a creative improvement across all individuals. So the reason why we create intellectual property, instead of saying um, that we only have physical property, is if we do this, on average, we're going to be better off than we would in a world in which we don't have this. How many iterations do we go? Well, we start with intellectual property, then we have fair use exceptions and the like. And essentially what the exercise is, is every transformation of right that is done by collective means is designed to create some kind of a Pareto improvement off of the Natural Rights Foundation. Please stop and thank you. <laughs> All right, the floor is open. Comments, questions? Come on. Get some responses. I'm going to talk further, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll offer just one story response to your jury story, which is the way these distributed infringement systems play out in the modern world is with very strong, very powerful jury appeal. Every juror understands that if she's bought her phone and it breaks, then it's hers. And that's the difference between sales and rentals. And, you know, of course, if you rent your apartment and something breaks, the landlord's going to fix it. But, of course, if you've bought it and something breaks, you've got to fix it. And I think that your lessons about the common law and about custom show that that distinction has great jury appeal and great appeal to lay jurists and is absolutely totally irrelevant because since the land between the rivers, uh, the Code of Hammurabi, Roman law, British law, and our common law, encumbered transactions are called security interests. Those are forms of sales. And as the formal private law sees it, that's still a sale. There are, in fact, true leases. And there is a distinction between a true lease and a sale. But it's not, um, are you a little encumbered or unencumbered? It is, is in fact, there any residual meaningful interest that's going to spring back? And only if there is a residual interest that will spring back will the old private law system treat it as a lease. And everything else is some version of a sale. Yeah, but look, I mean, this is not unique to modern stuff. This goes back to a very, very early time. And let me sort of mention some, some of the distinctions. Suppose what you do is you announce that you're going to give a lease of an asset for only 40 years, but the asset for certainty only has an expected life of 30 years. You may do this for collateral advantage, shifting depreciation deductions back and forth between people, but the Scott said there's no residual interest, so at this particular point, it's a sale. One of the intellectual property cases that we had was a case called Augusto. Mark Lundley argued it is a complete intellectual mess in terms of the way in which it came out. And what you did is you had a series of demo discs that were given to people. And the theory was, we're giving you these demo discs that you can play as opposed to advertise. But we want you to know, in effect, that when you're done with the disc, you have to do one of two things, either return it to us or to destroy it. And the point about this is that you did not want the demonstration of this to go into competition with the stuff that you put. And, and the lonely side managed to persuade the court um, that this thing was, in fact, a sale in some sense of the word, and so that, therefore, you were free under a doctrine of restraints of alienation um, against selling it to somebody else, at which point you undercut the market and you kill the market with demonstration records altogether. It's just a classic illustration of the state. But again, now, you can, but, but the common law gives you a simple yeah, answer, yeah, which yeah, is, you, you can. And let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing is leases are extremely complicated um, because there are many different kinds of 
And what you do is you start off with the lease, which is a pure property transaction. And the only thing you do is somebody else can use the land for X period of time. No service obligations whatsoever. This transaction is perfectly clean. And so if something goes wrong with the land, the risk will always fall on the tenant for his interest and for the landlord for the reversion. But modern industrial leases and modern residential leases often have a very heavy service component associated with their operation. And what we know, if we put the two things separately, the rules on property discussion and service cessation are completely separate from one another, and they work in very different ways. So I cannot provide services to you because of an impossibility, and I'm still entitled to something. It's not going to be the full cost of providing the service. It will be at most the lost profits from not being able to provide the service in question. And so you get different kinds of rules. Now, the point about this is that common law as between the two parties. Uh, the formality simply give you baselines from which you then deviate as you please in between and get the right result. The moment there is a regulatory framework in it, a trust framework, a patent framework, a tax framework, and you force the, these transactions into one side or another, but then in effect, small differences in, in characterization can lead to enormous differences in consequences. And you'd rather that not happen. So the sign of a good regulatory system is that essentially if the variations in private law are more or less continuous, on average you would like the variations in the public law to translate that continuity. So there will not be a situation where for tax purposes you want this thing to be a sale and for business purposes you want it to be something else. Uh, the one characterization governs all and it reduces the opportunities for strategic behavior. And that's part of the kind of the utilitarian transactional calculus which is lies at the heart of most people's systems. Okay, yes. Yeah, I have two short uh, remarks for Richard on the distinction between um, deontic and utilitarian justification of property rights. There's <coughs> one analysis, which was my, maybe a bit forgotten today, which is that it's not or uh, the deontic justification or the utilitarian justification. If you read people like Adam Smith or Hayek or today someone like Dave Schmitz, they will say at the societal level, the reason why we have uh, property rights is no doubt that this increases the overall welfare. Right, so at the societal level, the reason that you do to the terrorism. However, on the individual level, it's very important that we treat these rights as principles, otherwise the system breaks down. Imagine that each person calculates each time whether the overall utility will be enhanced or not if he breaks or respects the rule, right? You can compare it with something like traffic rights. Uh, traffic rights. The reason we have traffic lights is because our overall utility enhances if we respect the rules. So it's a utilitarian justification. However, on an individual level, we need to treat these rules very deontic. We need to treat them as if it's almost a natural right that you can go through when it's red, and but, but that you can't when it's red. So, so, so what about this idea that you just have two layers on societal level that's utilitarian, but for the system to work, we need to think of them as principles, as if Kant was right. And then I have a second question. Can I answer this one? Yes. <laughs> it, it's not wrong, but it's incomplete. Because one of the things that you have to ask is as follows. If you're an individual and you're facing a set of traffic rules, and you decide to deviate them to run a red light, you cannot defend in the individual case by saying, well, gee, I'm not in the system of property rights. We're going to make it two seconds long. So you take the system as it's step. But the other utilitarian element in this particular situation is how you decide the traffic rules. And that is also a very heavily utilitarian calculation. What you're trying to do is to maximize basically free net flow across the network over the course of the question putting it together. And so if you have low intensity traffic, you tend to have very few traffic rules. As the intensity gets better, you have more and more separation. So by the time you're done with it, uh, trains and cars are separated because they're overpasses and underpasses. Left traffic and right traffic are separated by a system of right uh, poles and so forth. All of those system design elements turn out to be heavily utilitarian. Mm -hmm. And what the utilitarian system says, essentially, the only time you're allowed to deviate from these rules is if somebody else has deviated from these rules first. And that's what we call the economics of reaction function, where it's very difficult to do it. So the basic principles sort of work exactly in that way. But the utilitarian stuff goes down in not only forming the societal justification, but also in forming the particular sub-rules and everything. Now, what's the other one? Uh, the other question was that someone in your uh, Liber Amicorum uh, mentioned that you never play the devil's advocate, so that most of your uh, opinions and articles are pretty consistent, that they're a yeah, I mean, of consistent set of ideas, yet uh, for someone like me or others in the room, it is sometimes useful 
play the devil's advocate and to, to invite you to phrase your opinion on, on something. So I know a vast amount of classical liberals who say that the reasons to have real property rights, property, property rights on real property, do not work for intellectual property, right? So, so um, for instance, if I have a house, and the reason why that house is fenceable is because if someone else intrudes the house, it deprives me of my right. The reason why a house is fenceable as well, or why we fence it, is because literally it's fenceable. <coughs> We've got an explosion of proliferation of private property rights with the invention of barbed wire, right? It's also a question of technique. Now, if I if I learn a song, or if I write poetry, or if I make a joke or something, uh, it's a little bit less fenceable, right? All will I do is somebody else phrases a joke. And the second thing is, it's not really because I invent a joke and somebody else in another room uses the joke that therefore my uh, welfare is decreased. You know? so, so why are not jokes just in the comments? Why are not songs just in the comments? Ah, right? this, I mean, I think all of us, the three of us, all agree on the answer to that question, which is you start with the real property model. And A, when you start with real property, all of a sudden you've discovered that only the full limit becomes inefficient in certain cases. And once you get over flight, it turns out that there's now a use for the upper ass phrase in the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If you have the usual rights of exclusion to things that are going on the lawn and skinny flight, airplane flight, the whole system breaks down. And so what you end up doing is having to cap the amount of the property rights. That's a taking for which I think is just compensation. In fact, one of my criticisms of the Gentleman Smith book is on page nine when they talk about that illustration, they don't see the any kind of compensation for one right? But they do cite you. You said it wasn't clear at the time of the invention of the airport that there would be a post Yes, but I mean, let's, you said more. All right, all right. You get the implicit in kind compensation, and a laundry is this is fuzzy, but you then do as you say 500 feet. So as to do it, but you don't do that for the rights because of that point in And so you do that oh. intellectual property, essentially the issue is not high discoloration. And an infinite property right means that the ability of somebody else to replicate is going to be necessarily blocked, even though you do so with zero cost. Uh, so you say, well, does that drive it down to zero? Well then you don't get the invention in the first place. So what you're trying to do is to figure out how you trade off these two things. And the IP system is always going to give more limited rights. How much shorter? And I think there's a uniform consensus on one proposition, a hopeless debate on the second. The uniform proposition is that copyright protections of them are always going to be more than patent protections. And the explanation for that is my son, it doesn't tell you how to write your son, but they're two guys that may come up with a telephone and file that. But Richard, today. consider software copyrights. Yeah. Yes. And of course, it doesn't that, really work as well for them. It doesn't, and that's exactly the problem. And yeah. some people say, well, the craziness of the thing, the term extension act, essentially, it is crazy in copyrights and so forth. Patents are generally shorter. But the theory is, the one variable that you alter is the duration variable. And then for everything else on alienation protection and so forth, the analogies start to carry over. Uh, what happens with the modernists is when they assume up. Uh, intellectual property starts from top down, which is, I think, a mistake, then anything goes with respect to the internal structure of the rights, and you start getting sort of big kinds of messes. So essentially what happens is every time you want to make a, a shift from a previous model, you have to justify it in terms of a parade of improvement, and you can usually figure those out. Okay, Eric had a comment, so since he's an author. Yeah, the, the quite, I wanted to uh, comment on the first part of the question. That the questions that, like the distinction that was being drawn between deontic and utilitarian, is I think exactly what Adam and I want to say. There's that those aren't the only two choices, and it's not a helpful way to frame things. So if we're talking about a, like a, a system of traffic laws, someone could say it's traffic laws create social benefits, but from a classic liberal perspective, what justifies the sheriff threatening people with penalty, with with traffic tickets or threats of going to jail, restricting their liberty for these other social benefits? And there's an answer to that. The answer is that the coercion to make people drive on one side of the road, just obey speed limits, traffic lights, redoubt, facilitates the free exercise of the liberty to travel. So the social benefits are welfare. They're, they're related back to the, to, to the interests of individuals. So it's actually the Pareto improvement rather than aggregate improvement, and there's no distributional dispute over it. That's right. So we're saying the same thing. Yeah, it's just that. Word on um, Pareto is assuming that people already have rights and 
Adam and I think that these, if you're assuming that something's created superior, that's because you have prior to the people no. that have certain rights. See, the disagreement is if you start with the Roman conception, God's coming back all the time, mm -hmm. of property rights being a race nullius, mm -hmm. and then essentially what you do is you say you have strong parade improvements if with respect to the land and similar things, what you do is you follow an occupy rule, which is not not the Lockean labor rule, which gets into all sorts of trouble. And with respect to the long and skinny, have it, the property right is exactly the opposite is defined as well, not to be excluded from common spaces. Both these systems then break down, and the question is how you make the incremental adjustments, and you'd like ideally each of those incremental adjustments to be a greater improvement. So it doesn't mean that you have to have property rights in order to run the improvements. It simply means that you have to have utilities under whatever system you have. And one of the big mistakes that people like Sunstein have made, one of many, is they said, well, you have to have a baseline. But that's wrong. All you need to do is you, you give me whatever arbitrary baseline you want, and I will come up and I will give you an arrival baseline. If mine is a parade of improvement over yours, it gets adopted. If we started with mine and you come with a contender and it fails, then we don't. So you don't have to care what the initial baseline is. You just have to compare two proposed baseline to see which of them comes better. The hard cases are, because these things are not perfectly homogenous, is sometimes you get lumpiness in which a large population may get some improvement and a small population of loss. For those of you curious, the coffin against the left-hand ditch company is a leading case on that, where a very smart court says, it's an imperative necessity that we switch out of the repairing system into a prior appropriation system and basically, the productive gains were probably 101. <coughs> and they didn't care about the residual losses when it came to that. And I think you agree with that decision, right? Oh, I do agree with the decision, but I would disagree. I, I would say that people have inchoate interest in the use of the water and the land. And so when, they're, when the calculations are being done about what's greater improving, it's the shift from riparianism to appropriationism is facilitating these inchoate interests in using the land and the water. Uh, yes, in the back, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to push back on the possibility of agreement between Richard's position and the merits because uh, it sounds like for, for, for Richard, if you're, if you're just aiming to the optimum market to minimize social costs, optimize social benefits, then it sounds like the level of intellectual property is going to be non zero, but essentially it's just up to social science what kind of intellectual property you create really for, because uh, it's whatever brings it more benefit. But it sounds like under Eric and um, Adam's view, um, the, the point of, of property right is, is not. It's not purely for social coordination, it's to secure you get no benefits for some costs, and to secure you your own individual labor for that, rather than just something to, to have the most of the optimum overall amount of. If you start with the value of the market, you know, you buy in buy And in terms of it being empirical, the answer is everybody agrees with that, but the issue is how do you get the incremental judgments? And we do not try to do it as an abstract function. If you start with, well, we'll start with five years, everybody says that's too small. You start with 20 years, you say it gets too low. So in the patent law, it's amazing how close the consensus is to around 15 years. And I think there's no similar cons consensus with respect to copyrights between life plus 20 years. Virtually everybody, I think, Sean, you would agree, uh, would think that probably 30 or 40 years would be the upper limit. Uh, which was the old view of the two 15-year terms in 1790. So it is empirical, but if you know something about the world, I think you can do better than random estimates on that. Uh, Lear, did you? Yeah, I, I I'll, I'll come this, back to you here. I think this goes to that point. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering uh, whether, particularly in areas of emerging technologies, whether we can ever be confident about judges' ability to reliably distinguish between short and squat and long and narrow, right? So thinking about some of the hot news cases that Chom wrote about, and thinking about them you know, from the perspective of the INS court, or even some of the later cases like the NBA scores yeah. cases, it just seems really hard to figure out uh, exactly what the right welfareist take is, or even take Scott's case of Grokster, which I think is right to you know, comment on the unanimity there. I mean, is the world a better place because Grokster was decided the way it was decided? Plausibly. But there's a plausible story that runs the other way that talks about sort of the dynamic effects of a relatively weak IP right there and thinking about uh, the kinds of steps that uh, the recording industry was taking to try and undermine these networks through self-help. So I think the, the worry about trying to employ um, sort of a real welfareist lens here is that especially the more common law this gets, the more of these kinds of judgments are going to look like guess if that yeah. is that wrong. But what if you, no. what if you, well, so I, 
Well, but can you, you can't, have the floor, and then I'll go Richard, and then I'm going to go to Eric. Can't we at least? I, I mean, I I suspect I, I offer the suggestion that we would find a lot of common ground on some common law principles that channel behavior. So on the question of you know, the empirical question over X number of years, is society better off? I don't know. On the question of how many zeros or what digits should be in the damages award, I don't know. But on the question of should there be a remedy and via one of these other, I think, common law mechanisms, I think, at least I'd like to suggest, we might even be able to get agreement on that. Yes. So that some remedy to channel some behavior through some common set of principles. Look, before, Richard, to put it in the simplest form, uh, these remedial choices are always appropriate. It's been a theme for the first session through, right? Uh, but if you have a choice between a common law system of latches on the one hand or a statute of limitations on the other, generally when the stakes are low, you're kind of willing to live with latches. When they get big, you don't. And so that recent opinion that Bruce Ginsburg wrote he said, you can't apply a doctrine of latches to somebody who is basically inside the statute of limitations. Strikes me as an importantly correct kind of decision because the uncertainty that you create going short is crazy. On the other hand, you toll statute of limitations. That, as you well know, has been allowed from the beginning of time. But it's interesting, the moment you leave the family context, you're told it because somebody's insane or they're only 14 years of age, and you get into the commercial situation, insane corporations, right? Infant corporations don't do it. Uh, so as you move context, the rule tends to be much firmer in both directions. I think that's it. And, and so many times, for example, with the oil and gas and with the prior appropriation, you start with an abstract principle, and sooner or later, as the stakes get higher, you end up with numbers, which is why you can't have a common law system of prior appropriation. Right? You've got to have somebody who's going to shut the gates. And that means he has to know how much water can go through. And it actually is not perfect, but it's a lot better than repairianism on Colorado. Richard, I think, Eric. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think quick, quick response there. Then we'll uh, Lear's yeah. question had a couple of extra points, though, embedded in it. I mean, I think the first thing that he's asking is there's an institutional component built into his question, right? Which is, why is it that the common law is necessarily better off than a regulatory regime? But beyond that, I well, think. The answer I gave to that is you switch back and forth between them. The statute of well, limitation is a regulatory regime. Kind of right. And, and, but I think there's a second one on the common law itself, which you're not answering. Namely, if the common law is your vehicle to achieve this adjustment over a period of time, the common law requires you to go in a particular direction. I think implicit in Lear's question was, the use of analogies in common law requires you to offer some kind of protection, as opposed to deny the very existence of a claim. So NBA versus Motorola, if you wanted to deny a claim altogether, the common law in and of itself would not provide you an answer. You have to rely on federal preemption, or you have to rely on some other kind of doctrine that says the cause of action is well, not sufficient. Well, federal preemption, of course, as I mentioned, it arises precisely because we don't have a unitary system. But the whole question from the earlier issue of whether or not when you give a statutory compliance regime but you allow the tort action, it was the same question that they faced in Hammersmith mm -hmm. and in um, Powell before and all the rest of that stuff. You cannot run a legal system with one set of tools. Okay, and the key is is figuring out when it is that you start to make these switches. And generally speaking, as an abstract inquiry, it's really hard. When you actually know something about the institutional fabric, the mistakes, the complaints, and the industry practices, you can do a lot better than that. All right. Uh, I think we are just about uh, at the end. I, I'm, I'm just hoping that Bill Pryor feels sufficiently punished for having said something about Roman law uh, <laughs> at this point. Uh, <laughs> the but but um, but anyway, uh, please join me in thanking the panel for a great discussion.